I returned last week from a heavy, meaningful, moving Central Synagogue board trip to Israel. 25 leaders there to listen, bear witness, and bring back personal testimony. One of the recurring messages we heard from so many Israelis was, we're not feeling PTSD. We're not post. We're still in the trauma. This is not just about being in the midst of a war or having soldiers in Gaza. So much of this for them was about having 130 hostages still in captivity. From the moment we landed in Ben Gurion Airport and saw the line of hostage posters in the corridor as we entered into the country, the captives were front and center in our experience, in distinction to how they have somewhat faded from view in conversation here in America and in our media. We made a promise to those we met that we would not forget them, and I want to share a few snapshots from Israel tonight. On our first full day, we visited Hostage Square, which is the plaza right outside the Tel Aviv Museum that's been overtaken with art exhibits and protests. I saw a woman in pajamas, barefoot, wearing a pregnancy belly, reading, Made in Gaza. She held a sign high above her head, Get my sister out of Gaza. In addition to the Shabbat table set for all of the misting hostages, a number of other art pieces have sprung up. One powerful one is a 30-yard tunnel that enabled us to experience the sealed space where hostages were being held below ground. The artist gives out markers, allowing you to write messages to the hostages, imagining that what we write in that temporary space could buoy those who have been held underground for more than 140 days is now 147. The tunnel ends with words lit up, Vayihi Or, let there be light. We met with Jonathan Dekelhen, who raised his family on kibbutz near Oz. Near Oz is one of the many southern kibbutzim that make up the bread basket, 80% of the food of Israel. And they practice the most high-tech farming in the world, he said it was a known security risk to live on that border, but they were willing to do it because 95% of the time it was paradise and because it was part of the national security project. The deal was they would farm all the way up to a meter of the border, and they did so in armored tractors. But the government's deal was that they would protect them. He said... That deal was broken on October 7th when one in 10 residents of Near Oz was massacred and another 80 were taken into captivity. Jonathan's son, Sagi, was one of them. He told us about his son, Sagi, 35, who grew up working with all the farm machines and he had a habit, one that his wife didn't love, of buying old city buses. Yes, many of them. He had a yard full of buses. He would retrofit them, one into a mobile produce market that he drove down to poor underserved communities. He repaired broken things to fix what was broken in the country. While Sagi remained captive, his wife, who was seven months pregnant on October 7th, gave birth to their third daughter, Shahar Mazel. We promised that we would share Sagi's story and call and protest and pray for his release. We visited Schneider's Children's Hospital, a hospital founded and supported by three generations of the Schneider Lesser family from Central Synagogue. It's a world-class hospital, the first of its kind in the region, centered on children, with a staff that is 30% Arab-Israeli doctors and nurses and it serves all children in the region, including those from the West Bank and Gaza. We sat with the hospital's CEO, Efrat Harlev, learning about how they've adjusted since October 7th, which included having to sandbag all of the windows for protection, and the fact that they have done multiple organ transplants from young fallen soldiers whose hearts and kidneys and lungs have given new life to ill children. While speaking, 
a helicopter whirred onto a landing, a landing pad right outside the window, and we could see Efrat stiffen. Every airlift is a wounded soldier right now, and she has two sons fighting in Gaza, a reality of only one degree of separation or less for every Israeli. She said that it took her about 10 days after getting over the shock of October 7th before she called together a meeting of her staff and announced, we must prepare for the return of these child hostages. It wasn't if they return. It was preparing for the only conceivable future of having them home. They learned about every child and family, their clothing sizes, their favorite toys and stuffed animals, and prepared for their return. They planned for therapists and treatment and sensitive reunions. And then she showed us a video of the miraculous day when most of these children did indeed return, arriving on that same helipad right outside the window, the hospital being their first entry port into freedom. We saw videos of children running into the arms of their parents and grandparents, the joy, relief, and breakdown of a father seeing his young son after 50 days of captivity. There was not a dry eye in the room. On our fourth day of the trip, February 12th, there was some incredible news. Two older hostages, Luis Har and Fernando Marmon, had been rescued in an overnight high-risk extraction from a civilian apartment where they had been held in Rafia. Only later, when I was listening to the Promised podcast, did I learn of what this daring rescue took. The IDF actually built a full-size replica of the apartment so they would know exactly how it was laid out and how long it would take to move from one place to another in the dark. They studied pictures of the hostages and even made computer-generated images of how they might look after 128 days of captivity with less food and no medicine and less sleep. They wanted to make sure they had zero hesitation in discerning who the hostages and who Hamas were in that room, for they calculated they would have approximately three seconds before Hamas would be able to turn the guns on them or on the hostages. They played out every possible scenario, in this middle-of-the-night raid, including what to do if one of the hostages was in the bathroom when they came in, or if they fainted. Once they blasted the door open, two of Israel's bravest, most unbelievable commando soldiers, wearing clay vests, identified only as Yud and Aleph, had the task of grabbing Louise and Fernando, carrying them to the porch, lying them down, and climbing on top of them and using their very bodies to protect them from Hamas soldiers in the room. You'd said on the next day to the paper, the level of danger was so high, I knew the chances of coming back wounded or worse were great. Of course, I could not tell my wife what I was doing, but she's no dummy. She saw me checking the weather report in Rafia. All this while the couple's baby slept next door. The entire operation, from start to finish, took one hour, not counting the entire month and 1,000 soldiers who prepared and planned and practiced for it. When the Hamas gunmen were dead, the commandos radioed back, the diamonds are in our hands. In Kitisa, our tour portion of the week, in the midst of a lot more famous episodes like the Golden Calf, we hear of Bitzalel, the artist who creates the Mishkan with all kinds of precious metals and gemstones. The stones were used on the breastplate, denoting every tribe of Israel. If any of those stones were missing, the breastplate and the nation would not feel complete. So too, if we were missing these diamonds. John Poland, who spoke here at Central, father of hostage Hirsch Goldberg Poland said, there is a very high price to pay for, the, for getting the hostages home. There is a bigger price to pay for not getting them home. We must plan, like Efrat, for when they return because the alternative for these 130 and their families and the nation, it's unthinkable. 
we must take the calculated, expertly executed risks we might need to do to bring them back. And we cannot rest until all the diamonds are in our hands.